The history of urban planning in America has been incredibly intricate. The way cities have been built and developed has shifted depending on area and the era of the country. Some cities have been planned as they're developed, working with the natural expansion of population and new building. But some have taken the route of preparing for this growth by planning out entire sections of their city before an ounce of concrete is poured. On the extreme edge of this, entire cities have been thought out and planned out beforehand, appearing out of thin air due to a group of planners or a single person's idea. So today we're going to talk about that and give some major examples across the country of cities you might not have known were pre-planned. Before the video starts though, make sure you do subscribe to the channel. We make geography content like this every week. So if that's the kind of thing you enjoy, click the subscribe button so you don't miss any future uploads. It's easy for you and very helpful for me. Thank you. So why do pre-planned cities exist? Is it just to save the trouble of constant development and talks of where to put everything? Is it to make a cleaner looking city layout? Well, maybe, but usually it has to do with the financial aspect of it. For a lot of examples, it came from a group of planners or just a singular person attempting to make a lot of money by creating a city and selling the land. And a lot of the times this did work. There's also government related examples with a lot of the capitals of US states being pre-planned. But only some of them are the complete pre-designed type that I'm talking about in this video. There's also company towns, where a large company has a factory or headquarters in an area. So they create their own city for workers in that company. This is a more divisive type of city, because it forces the city to rely almost completely on said company. Meaning if one or the other goes down, they both go down. So let's get into our examples and talk more specifically on how they came to be and why. Starting with, in my opinion, the best example our country has to offer, which is Washington, D.C. So the U.S. Capitol served as an important step for U.S. planning. Being a large city, planned from scratch after the passing of the Residence Act in 1790, which approved the creation of the Capitol. Soon after, in 1791, President Washington chose the French architect, Pierre Lafont, to design the new city. He released the LaFont plan, which mapped out the city's streets. This brought us to the current design. The central part of DC has a grid pattern stretching all around, with diagonal roads working their way all around the city, with major roundabouts and landmarks at the important intersections. This made for a very distinct layout that's very recognizable on maps. Now obviously with something so historic, the city has changed a lot since then. Interstates 395 and 695 were built in the city, and outer parts were developed in different ways, being outside the original plan. Regardless, you can still see that pre-designed influence on any neighborhood in the city. This video is sponsored by Royal Match, a Match 3 puzzle game in which you help King Robert build and renovate his castle. It's a completely free, stress-free game that can take you away from whatever life you have with a relaxing experience that a lot of people need. And with the no ads, you can play the game with no distractions and just enjoy yourself. I think it's really fun how the game has multiple aspects, and it's not just a puzzle game, because you also get to build the castle as it goes. As well as that, I love competing with my friends using the teams feature, because we're all on one team, but we can check each other's progress and one-up each other. If you're interested, you can download Royal Match for free using the link in my description. I'd really appreciate it because every individual installation also helps me financially. Thank you to Royal Match, and let's get back to the video. Next, we move to the most major company town in the country, which is in a significantly different situation than Washington, D.C., and that's Gary, Indiana. So Gary, Indiana is a very poor city in the Chicago metropolitan area, known for its history in the steel industry. Gary was founded in 1906 with the building of a new steel plant, Gary Works. The city was used as a company town because with such a large plant being created in the area, it would supply enough jobs for an entire city. So that's what they decided to do. Immediately, the city saw growth as new employees moved there. Through the first 26 years of its existence, it reached a population of over 100,000, as steel in the U.S. peaked. This continued into the 1950s, where it began to see a shift in the wrong direction. See, as I said, the problem with making company towns is that the town will go down with the company. And steel started to see a major decline in the U.S., so Gary was taken with it. The population began to decrease, and the median income went with it, due to white flight in the city where upper-class white families fled for the suburbs. Since then, it has fallen into ruins, being one of the most dangerous and worst cities in the U.S. 
It's a prime example of a pre-planned city just not working because of the specific situation it happened in. Now, the road layout for Gary does show the historic company town aspects, being gridded out south of Gary Works. There wasn't a lot of thought going into making it a pretty town, but it's not messy either. Next, we have Levittown, the one that I think may be the most interesting example of pre-planned cities. So, obviously, there's Levittown, Pennsylvania, located in the Philadelphia metro near Trenton, New Jersey. But what's interesting about this is that there's three different Levittowns in the Northeast. Two with the same name, and one with a new name. Why is this? Well, let's go back to 1929, when the Levitt and Towns, Inc. was founded by Abraham Levitt. Originally, this was a company that built custom homes in the Northeast, mostly in the New York area. After World War II, though, there was a crisis in the U.S. involving affordable housing, especially for returning veterans. So the company chose a spot on Long Island to build 6,000 low-priced homes, making it the largest pre-planned development in U.S. history at the time. So they began to build this city, which is now known as Levittown. It ended up including 17,000 homes in the end. During the project, the company emphasized their fast, efficient, and cost-effective construction, with a production rate of 30 houses a day when the city was being built in 1948. Present day, the city doesn't stand out as anything special, with a population of 51,000. Now, the company wasn't done yet, though, because in 1952, they constructed another community of over 17,000 homes in Levittown, Pennsylvania, probably the most major instance of this. It obviously has the same look to it as its Long Island counterpart, and I think it's interesting that present day, the population is very similar, at 53,000. Levitt & Sons was still not done yet, constructing yet another development on top of the Willingboro Township. Here, it took much of the town up immediately, and it was voted to change the township's name to Levittown Township, adding yet another one to the pile. But because it was just 12 miles away from Levittown, Pennsylvania, the city was forced to change its name back to Willingboro after four years, being the reason why there isn't another instance of the name. Those were the main creations of the company, but there were a few more communities, from Maryland all the way to Puerto Rico. It was a large-scale project by the company. Next up, we move to Florida. Now, Florida has too much to talk about for just one segment, and I have a full video about it that I suggest you watch if this specifically interests you. But basically, Florida is absolutely full of these pre-planned developments, and there are still lingering effects of this. Basically, when the population in the state began to explode, land was super cheap. So businessmen decided to buy huge swaths of land and sell them as individual parcels for cheap to residents looking to move to the state. This created so many new communities, some better than others. But that brings us to Cape Coral. So with this city specifically, the history began as late as 1957, when two brothers flew over the peninsula and decided to purchase the 103 square miles of land for under $700,000 and begin development on a massive planned community. Canals were dug, streets were paved, and houses began to be built. The entire city was planned out before a single person moved there, and the only main thing was that every single house wasn't built yet. Population continued to boom, with the entire planned community still being finished, and houses being built moving northward. This growth continued up until 2008, when it was obviously halted. That's how the city appeared out of nowhere, and how many more communities just like it did the exact same thing in the state. That's not a unique storyline at all with there being other developments of the same nature in the same metropolitan area. Now, there are more of these when it comes to suburban development, places out west in the Phoenix metro, places in the Houston metro, like obviously the Woodlands, Springs, and Cinco Ranch, or places in the Denver metro like Centennial or Highlands Ranch. But these were the best examples of different ways these developments came to be. I think it's interesting to think about whether or not these are good things. Most of the time, they result in cities people aren't a fan of, but it's not necessarily a bad idea. It does make a city feel more unnatural, and more often than not, will take away any character and make a weird area. The thing is, this continues to be common with new development in suburban areas outside of cities. And if we're being honest here, yeah, they try to put effort into giving character to the new areas, but it's already in a situation where that's not the biggest concern and there isn't a history that gives these cities something to be proud of. Thanks for watching. 
Thank you to the members this week, JL, Sir JC17, Bryson, Jerome McCall, Dominic Psyche, Rosebud4, KMS162, Jeremy Jarvis, Christopher DeAngelis, Dark Bird, Elijah Path, Big Pasty, Jeremy Crone, Wolfling73, Snyder Schwein, Florida Jake, Stormy Knight, Makita Martinoff, Benjamin Whiting, Ryan Devins, and Hazev the Wolf. I appreciate you all so much. You do a lot for the channel. If you want to become a member, the link is down in the description below. Any membership just helps me, and all the money just goes into my savings. So if you appreciate the content and want to help me as a person, that's the best way to do it. Thank you.